uh, we're going to cover Woolen Folk. Uh, this is like a new update to what's everything going on. This was like one of my original videos. I think, Jim, you watched this one way, way back when, when I did it. And you said you actually enjoyed the story, at least how I told it. And I just kind of want to see your thoughts and opinions on that before I go into this. Yeah, that's back when I was a baby chatter. Like, I think <laughs> it was like one of the first or second stream that I was actually here for live. And then now I'm here. So it's like this weird sort of like, like I, like our friendship grew while the festival unraveled. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all, all, all the drama. All the puns there intended. With the unraveling and yard and shit. All yeah. of that was intended. Well, we don't want to muddy up the story. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, as we watched from the original stream that I didn't, they, they don't need help. <laughs> no. He did, did it well enough on its own. Oh, my God. That story is so bad. But yeah, there's some there's some interesting updates going on with this, and uh, this comes from uh, the Emma chick that I originally covered in the first Fiber Fest video. They did awesome coverage. Uh, I actually so I found this whole story through a totally different channel that I didn't even use in the story. They actually used some coverage from Emma. They used a lot of sources that I kind of helped gather even more beyond that to cover for my version of it their video was shorter than emma's coverage on it and i was like no this kind of actually deserves an in-depth look even more beyond what even emma was doing because i was like this is crazy like financially to cover so yeah cause you have that expertise too like so it's interesting too somebody from outside the i can't believe i'm saying outside the yarn community <laughs> Like, <laughs> the fact that there's a yarn community like simultaneously makes me smile but also confuses the hell out of me well not only like, that it's like one of the most drama fueled communities out there like, right? it's, like it's like the paranormal community it's like a, it's like ghost hunters but it's a bunch of like catty school children acting people. <laughs> well, it's like we just want to know if ghosts are real bro the like... thing is the thing that shocked me with this and it kind of kind of aligns a little with like the paranormal thing that you brought up like these are not cheap hobbies like I, I i've been in cars into cars and like clearly that's like one of the more expensive hobbies you can have but like the amounts of money these people will drop on Things that to me mean nothing to them mean a lot, but like just even attendance to like a show or a con or something like that. So like this all piggybacks off of a big show that goes on in Rhinebeck, New York and like just the entrance costs and everything else. It was like 60 bucks a person, if I'm remembering correctly. And like these people would spend hundreds of dollars individually so like there was a big deal for the vendors and stuff that did this because they yeah, make thousands with a, niche market, like, with a niche market like this yeah like it's definitely one of those hobbies that like it kind of reminds me of like warhammer and stuff right like it's like a niche hobby yeah but like, it's so it's niche enough that like it's a premium hobby like it's mm -hmm. not like you're like oh i'm gonna go and get a coloring book like it's like a legitimately like premium costing hobby yeah oh man all right so here let's start the update see what you know, you forget how, what people said to you or you know but you always remember how people made you feel right hello class so i wasn't planning on talking about this again but it turns out there are some developments and i wanted to share them with you the third annual woolen folk yarn festival was to put it very lightly uh, an absolute disaster accessibility concerns communication issues unsafe vending conditions and torrential downpour turned to what should have been a fun day relax oh the whole building fucking thing was a disaster with this i remember that like, it was truly right. fucking, I don't know how, even with, like, I don't know, like, you, they had to get, there's an occupancy limit on the building that they booked. They had a previous two years worth of attendance, so they knew, like, occupationally, like, or, yeah, occupationally, how many people sh would come to this show. Yeah, and, and like, potentially like a growth figure too. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Okay, like you know, we've seen twelve percent increase in attendance. We can estimate around ten to fifteen. Like, yeah, yeah, and like they grossly used a undersized area because they were not able to get approved for the larger venue. That they basically said, "Oh, 
So the show's going to be here up till almost the last second. They said it's going to be in this one location, which was like an orchard. And then at the very last second, they possibly could. They changed to a totally different lo location that was like 40 miles away. And it was grossly undersized and grossly understaffed. And just, it was awful. And there was a whole legal thing with that that I don't even remember if I got into on my stream where the basically the city board's like, yeah, no, we're not going to allow this. I think on your um, stream it was still, like, pending. Okay. <laughs> like, so, like, it, but it's like, you literally just described a fluffy Tanacon. Yeah. <laughs> like, that, that's exactly what happened with Tanacon. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I, I under under delivery on the expectation on the size of the uh, event, um, attendant, you know, attendance that doesn't match the size of the venue. You you have the vendors being completely screwed. You know, it, it's literally it's literally fluffy Tanacon. Yeah, like, I mean, the only the only caveat is you didn't have a bunch of white women queuing up in a parking lot with pumpkin spice lattes passing out in the summer sun or fall sun. Yeah, because they were older <laughs> and they had walkers. They had, they had walkers and medication instead. Well, well, that's the thing. It was so like, dangerous they weren't even able to get to it. <laughs> Like, there was a whole second floor, I remember, and, like, the elevator's, like, an older building elevator that was meant for, like, five people maximum. And they were trying to, like, cram people into this building because it's raining outside, nobody wants to be outside in the rain. And, like, so a lot of people were naturally congregating to the inside, and, like, you had to, for anybody that was, like, mobility disabled... You would have to use this elevator. There was like a line for the elevator. One person was basically put in front of the hallway for the bathroom as their vending booth. Like this was just such a shit show. <laughs> I, I really like the like the natural gatekeeping. Like how much do you really like yarn? Yeah. How much like, <laughs> enough to die for it? <laughs> like you know, like it sounds like an exaggeration, but how they were not able to get like how somebody didn't end up injured worse than what happened or like or like yeah actually like having like a a life or death event i i don't understand because yeah you know that this is a lot of like it's a very unique community i will say that like when i looked at it from the outside in you have the you know your your expected group of people where it's like the older women into this stuff like retired age and stuff like that but then there's a lot of like niche like almost like uh silicon valley type pop-ups and stuff where they would have like vegan yarn they would have like natural dyeing processes organic yarn and stuff like that and like these really young people who maybe also have disabilities or sociability issues or whatever would also be into this because it's a it's a low sensory impact hobby yeah and i could definitely see that too because it's one of those like I could almost see it being like like a nouveau sort of like how like crocheting in a way is having a comeback because it's like vintage and there's yeah. like a charm to it being like yeah. a vintage hobby like my grandmother used to do it so now I'm doing it and and it's almost like there's like a charm to it of like the old days yeah there's this you know zoomers is really starting to apply more and more the more I look at it from the outside in like, there is genuinely, like, a whole generational leap where millennials live differently than boomers. Yeah. And, you know, Gen X and millennials probably live different from boomers. And now you've got a point to where you're basically kind of horseshoeing around to where Gen Z is more like what my grandparents were like with, like, the knickknacks and, like, these certain things and everything else. And it's like, you know, as much as you call people boomers and, like, all this shit... You're sure wrapping around to it. <laughs> well, yeah, it was one of those things where it's like it's almost like a neo, um, like one of those neo movements. Yeah. Because like you know when I grew up I was in like the neo Victorian movement like you know big flowy 
coats and shit. Like yeah. I'd shave with a straight razor and stuff like that. Like it it seems like that's like that generational thing is like maybe like you know the twenties through the forties, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. The fall the Fallout style architecture and yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that sort of feeling well, that. Sort even of even then, I feel like we had our own take on it because you could point and say like, okay, well that's where steampunk really kind of originated. Yeah, I, yeah, that's the spinoff of that. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I I don't know. This is more like almost like a copy paste. The more I look at it, and it's just weird to me. It really is and enjoying community and yarn into a muddy nightmare. If you haven't watched my previous video about Woolen Folk, stop this one and go watch that one now. I won't be going into any of the nitty gritty details of what actually went down at this event, and I feel like that context is important to know for this video. Don't worry, I'll be here when you get back. If you choose to... Don't worry, we just gave you, like, all the context. <laughs> Aside the way from the... she looked at me, like, going, look at that, like, yes, ma'am. Like, <laughs> Aside like, from the I've fact already... that, like, I think I've... I calculated the woman made a... may have made off with, like, a quarter of a million to $300,000 roughly Jesus. yeah which that gets brought up in here like actually how much they think she made off with and stuff yeah like it gets brought up it's still it's still bad a year later Jeez. yeah move forward you do so at your own risk everyone pull out one of your projects and we'll, we'll wait for them to get back okay are they gone okay did you see their outfit it was so cute okay welcome back if you just watched my other video now you're coming back so Let's get into it. Following this big backlash in response to the event, people are wondering if the vendors can and should be seeking legal action for breach of contract and just like overall not being safe at this event. I want to spend the first part of this video sharing some updates about financial restitution offers that were sent to the vendors. Then I'll briefly cover some additional background on Felicia Stenhouse Eve, the owner of String Thing Studio and the main organizer of this event. And I'll finish the video off with some analysis and commentary of why I think this event flopped so hard. But before we get into it, let's hear a quick word from the sponsor. We're not going to hear the sponsor. I apologize. I, I hate to disappoint. <laughs> I mean, what what could the sponsor be? <laughs> Moment for fifty five percent off your first month at Sentbird. Sentbird. Only about. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's get back to it. Like I was actually like really curious if it was like a yarn or like a craft sponsorship, because it's like okay, you know, I would actually like you know go to the website, check it out, like you yeah. know what kind of cool stuff you have, but it's just Sentbird. It's like I I smell bad enough. I don't need help. <laughs> <laughs> Vendors began sharing on their social media some of the offers that they got for restitution from their losses at the Woolen Folk Festival. A reminder for context, vendors paid around 800 to 9 So this would have all come out after I covered this. So these are, this is, because remember, like, there was, like, a bunch of uproar was kind of, like, where I left this. And, like, yeah, they were people were investigating. Yeah, people were pissed. Like, so there was restitution offers. And, like, they're oh. atrocious. Oh, no. $900 for a 10 by 10 foot booth, which is a higher cost than comparable festivals in the area. In addition to these costs, many were flying in or shipping their stock from other states. And of course, they also had to cover things like accommodation, food, and compensation for any employee. And this wasn't, like, this is one thing I do remember about this thing. Like, this, it, when they say, like, flying in from different states, there's people flying in from different countries. Like, the whole Rhinebeck thing is, like, fucking huge. It's, it's you know, San Diego Comic Con or, you know, like, insert con for whatever your niche hobby is like the biggest one that's what Rhinebeck is to these people that they brought to this event. Super long story short, because of this poor planning and the inability of the attendees to actually shop the booths like they had planned, many vendors walked away from this event with far lower sales than they had anticipated. And for reasons completely outside of their control, like their booth being set up on a stairwell where people couldn't really get to it, or their booth space being so muddy and waterlogged that nobody could actually enter and look at what they had. About a week after the event, around 30 of the vendors reached out to Felicia's team to request full refunds for breach of contract for a combined $27,150. Maria Silvia discusses what happens in this article written for the Times Union. She says, the group's email outlined how Stenhouse Eve had failed to fulfill the contract, including changing the venue and failing to provide adequate space, amenities, promised swag bags, accessibility, and more. Some vendors did not request reimbursement and rather signed in solidarity with others. These vendors... Now, I would say out of the vendors that applied and had that, that was the total amount, you know, she easily probably could have covered that, actually. Like, when I look back, because that's not including, like, the attendance costs, and I remember there was, like, the gala thing that was, like, a VIP thing, and, like, um... Oh, like the bologna sandwich that was like thirteen dollars. Yeah. Like... <laughs> and like they're not even like looking to cover the costs of like the missed sales opportunities. It's really just a small percentage of people that are bitching. And I, honestly, when the grand scheme of things, like I said, I think I calculated she probably made out with somewhere around, I think like two hundred grand. Like, if I want to be conservative, it was around that figure. So, like, repaying, like, 15% of that money and you're able to keep 85% of it, 
I mean, granted, you'll still be a shitty person, but there's nothing those other people can do. I would have done it. I mean, yeah, at least you were not taking, like, you can get the PR of, like, I'm trying to make it right while still, like, massively profiting. Yeah. Like, it yeah, would be the I mean, smartest it, move to make. If you ever like, did want to do this again later on down the road, you you could potentially draw some of those vendors back because while they did get wronged, like, you at least made it right in their eyes. So that'd be 30 vendors easy for, like, any event you ever would want to put on were then given an For offer sure. in November, which they turned down because it was too low. They received a second offer in December, which was up to half of the registration costs, which they also turned down. And then they weren't given another update until February 29th, 2024. And that was only after some of the vendors had sent two follow-up emails because Felicia was just so hard to get in contact with. Sylvia continues saying, Felicia's offer withheld all reimbursement from vendors who declined contracted space or who received negotiated space inside Orland. Vendors who were shorted would receive between $8 and $250 for the square footage they were promised but did not receive. Vendors who had an outdoor booth would get back 10% of their registration fee, according to the emails. So yeah, these vendors have been waiting for four months months, they receive this offer and they're thinking, okay, surely now it must be a fair offer, right? Many of these vendors spent thousands of dollars on an event that was not only not profitable, but was just like a miserable experience for all of them. And their access to making sales was just throttled by poor event planning. One vendor, Megan Granger, requested a full booth refund of $800 and was offered $250, which seems to have been one of the highest offers, at least out of the vendors that I've seen post or- Isn't that insane? Like, <laughs> like not even like, like, it's like a quarter of the value. Can you imagine any other industry or business doing that? Right? Like, well, it, like, if you listen to the chain of negotiations there, they actually took a step backwards. They had, like, started at a lower amount. They declined that immediately. They went up to 50%. They declined that. And then it went to 20, to what, 20% roughly? <laughs> Like no, you're you're not doing this right. You're you're supposed to go up. Yeah, like, you screwed me. You're supposed to go up. Yes. <laughs> Or were in contact with the Times Union for this article. Another vendor, Lila Lawless, requested a refund of $900 and was offered $90, plus, get this, $38.58 for weatherproofing materials she had purchased. Okay. Another vendor, Home Row Handcraft, was offered $16. This was in response to a partial refund request for the booth not being the actual 10 by 10 space that they had paid for. Part of the reason why this offer in particular is so low is because the organizer said they had video proof that the space actually was a 10 foot by 10 foot square, but the reality was, because of, again, the flow of traffic through the event, there was a footpath that cut through this booth space, so even though the space was technically inside the booth, there was no way that this person could set up any product in that part of the booth and so it was completely unusable apparently many of the vendors were also offered zero dollars restitution and then the real catch of this very little wait, offer wait, is that wait. many of the vendors who <laughs> so they basically it's like you give us money we'll put you on the sidewalk yeah and now fuck off yeah like but like how do i sell my product <laughs> like, that was for like, you to figure out jim that is not Felicia's problem. <laughs> you know what I would have done to be petty? I would have set up my product as a blockade. <laughs> across the 10 foot section, just one giant line. And then I would just stand there and stare at her. Well, you know, I, I would have. Eye contact I, like I was Slender Man. I would have just set up a, a small maze. So that way they still could get through. But to take in time in the store. <laughs> See, I, I like how that, that like we differ. Like you're like I can make some sales from this, and me, it's like I just want to be as petty as I can. <laughs> like I just want everyone to be as miserable as me. Like, <laughs> look, they're queuing in my store in for the bathroom. I I can apply pressure tactics at that point that'll get anybody. <laughs> Like, it's like, or you could buy this for eighty dollars and get a fast pass. Yeah. Start selling fast passes. Like jokes on you, bitch. Have have designated line holders, and like the more you buy, you can get a designated higher line holder pass. So like closer right. to the front. <laughs> You know, I don't know if that would be cruel or brilliant or like some sort of like horrific like uncomfortable in between <laughs> oh I, I i think it hits all of it to accept the offer had to sign a contract saying that they would not publicly speak negatively about the event does this hold up legally threatening to sue is free and actually filing a case so that was a key thing that kind of stuck out to me that you would publicly not speak negatively about the event that stands out to me because i it sounds like felicia plans to have an event eventually 
and like they don't want people they want to minimize the impact of damage and like so when people look up her name they don't see as much bad publicity out there dude i i swear if i'm paying money for a booth and you screw me there is no way in hell am i like agreeing to some non-disparagement clause because you don't know how what you're doing yeah i am sorry i am sorry like no how about this how about you disparage yourself and stop doing events because <laughs> like, because clearly you don't have the iq to handle it yeah probably is not going to be worth it for the Woolen Folk people. If one of these vendors were to accept their offer, receive their $16 check, and then go on to continue posting, are they going to do anything about it? It's going to cost them more money than it's worth, probably. So yeah, they're trying to buy the silence of these vendors with, like, lunch money. So here's what this contract says. We are a small, supportive community and hope to resolve this matter as it has been a looming issue that we all want to close and not exacerbate. In the spirit of healing, the agreement will ask the signing vendor not to publicly speak negatively of Woolen Folk going forward. This is a small business that wants to remain in the community and do its best. Constant negative publicity erodes that ability. I'm speechless. You can't make this stuff up. On their Instagram stories, Homero Handcraft posted a screenshot of this email along with the caption. For the record, no one is speaking anything except the truth about what happened at the show. The reason vendors have been silent since October is because we were allowing the organizer ample time, grace, and opportunity to apologize, acknowledge fault, and make amends. That never happened. So I find this language so offensive and belittling, and to think, a whopping $16. They say, since October, even more behind-the-scenes nonsense has come to light. Nothing has been resolved, no apologies, no remorse, no contact, no accountability. In the spirit of healing, hilarious. This transactional trash gag order is actually how you yourself erode your own ability to remain in the community. Don't put that shit on us. Thanks. So I believe what this person is referring to, uh, the more behind-the-scenes things that have come to light, is information that I found in this post on Reddit where the user claims that Felicia allegedly did not pay the event providers either. What do you think about that before you, we get into it? What? <laughs> so you just walk in and just start setting up and they're like, you need to pay us. And you need to be like, yeah, don't worry about it. And then she just keeps setting up. Even more justification. Because remember, she arranged that at space last minute. So it kind of does make sense. Can you imagine if I just showed up to Walmart and just started like setting up like a Magic the Gathering booth to sell trading cards? <laughs> and Walmart's like, you can't do that. I'm like, okay. And I just keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, just, like, keep, just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> it'd be like you, you start. You can't do that. It's like yeah, and I have a fo foil tarmogoyf, and then, <laughs> and then and, 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 like, wh what does that even mean, sir? It's like yeah, yeah, yeah no. Force the will, hundred two, hundred twenty dollar force the will. Yeah. It's like you're mumbling, like you're in tongues. Like, are you possessed, sir? <laughs> oh, I want to see, because we're not gonna do the whole uh summary but yeah we we there's there's even more here this person what? says she didn't pay several of the local service providers she didn't pay the local event planner the first aid provider and several others she is a and we'll take this one with a grain of salt didn't pay the first aid provider the people that were there in the case of her event becoming a disaster which it did it, it did yeah, like, <laughs> that was like the first and last person you should have paid like yes. <laughs> like pay them twice because you need them <laughs> Okay. I don't have any further proof or receipts of this. This is alleged, and the alleged source is a Reddit post. Legally, I'm not saying this happened, but it is something that I would believe allegedly did happen. According to this article and posts I've seen shared by the vendors themselves, none of the restitution payments have been accepted or paid. In the last video, I talked briefly about some of Felicia's past money problems, but let's talk about a few more. In 2020, she turned to GoFundMe as a way to get enough funding. I'm going to pause here for a second. I desperately got to pee. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll wait to make my joke. Okay. <laughs> Learn to tell time. You're early. Okay, I'm back. I was going to say, maybe your dog works for Chewy. <laughs> or not Chewy, FedEx, because... <laughs> Wait, now that you're back, I will mention my joke. All right. As I just can't wait for her to go onto social media and like, guys, I am fully funding the next festival. I have found an infinite money glitch. <laughs> and I am fully self-funding the next festival. Whoa. And it's like, oh, cool. I see how this is going to go. Like... Hey, hey, Jim. What's up? James Earl Jones is dead. What? Yes. This is not the kind of tangent I wanted to have. <laughs> yeah. Academy <laughs> World Academy winning actor James Earl Jones, voice of Darth Vader in Star Wars, Mufasa and the Lion King, and appeared in Simpsons multiple times, has passed. Okay, my childhood literally just died right now. Like Duchess County, New York, was where he passed. Wow. Damn. Dude, I, I can't mock that. Yep, Field of Dreams, like, Othello, Midsummer Night Dream, 
He was in his 90s, though, right? Like, he yeah. was... Yeah, he was up there. Great White Hope. I mean, this man, his debut film was Dr. Strangelove. Jeez. I just... Not to go off on a tangent like we normally do, but, like, it, it just seems like we're losing all these brilliant, like, film stars, and the modern-day equivalent just doesn't hold a candle. No. No, I mean, you, know what I you, mean? you get very few in a generation, and I feel like it's even fewer because of so much, um, so much technology has played into cinematography anymore. Like you don't, yeah. you're as an actor, you don't need to be as skilled as you used to be. Like honestly, like when, that... when you, like even thinking back, like look at the '90s generation of actors. Like a lot of them were like the last generation to really even do their own stunts, work with physical effects. Like so much is just yeah. digital now. They don't have, they don't have, they're not able to act. They act off of a green screen. So that's why they're do- dead soulless actors and actresses. Yeah, it's it's just really disappointing because it's like I remember like you know growing up in the '90s and stuff like that, and like yeah. you know even even with the Star Wars prequels, right? Like as not good as they were at the time, man. Like when Darth Tyrannus was on the screen, you know, that just that old school style, like you know european stage training that you see from like patrick stewart and ian mckellen and like that's so missing now yeah now you get like these carbon copy almost almost like tiktok actors right like yeah where everything's like and it's like don't get me wrong i love like chris pratt right i think he's funny because you know i watched him on parks and rec and stuff when he was first coming up but man like he it, it's it always feels like, hey, guys, ha-ha, and it's like, oh, yeah, but, like, there's no gravitas to it. No. And he's and he's still, and he's one of the better ones. You know what I mean? Like, he's one of the better ones, and I can say that he doesn't have the gravitas of, like, you know, a James Earl Jones or a Sean Connery. If you ever, do you have Disney Plus at all? I think so. I might. You ever want to watch a very fantastic movie? Uh... Industrial Light and Magic is what this is about. It's basically the company that Lucas made to help make Star Wars. It was all the special oh, effects guys. Yeah, that, that documentary. I'm, Fantastic. About, like, Lucas. Because yeah. this will actually, I think, possibly breathe new hope into that. Like, when at the very end, they're talking about, like, emergent technologies. And, like, have you ever seen, like, the set of The Mandalorian? Yeah. The screen? Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I think so. Okay. Uh, my magic. I'm Mando. Set. Is there possibly going to bark right now anyway? Because my life should be on Zoom. They have this giant screen. I'm trying to, like, find a good picture of it. Like, here, for scenes like this, right? This is a blended scene, actually. Really? Yes. This is not as special effects as you think. Right? So... They'll green screen out this small area to make this ramp look like it came down from the back of this ship. And then there's physical, like, this is actual dirt. There's actual physical props around them. But then the distance, it kind of almost goes back to old movies. But instead of painted, it's a large, like, uh, 270 degree curved screen. But it's like, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, uh... Uh, I, I kind of want to see if I could find like the actual like screen. Like, yeah. Just sort of, like, like gives, when it's like, off. The scale of what it looks like. Here we go. Here it is. See it? That's insane. Yeah. So it works off the principles of older movies. Your, your older 30s and 40s paint, hand painted back sets. And instead of using hand painted now, it's all digital. And they blend it so well that you can't tell. Yeah, there's there's a good picture of it. Without the screens. And like they, oh, they, that's cool. they can even emulate the sky and everything else. The only thing that bothers me with it is like they can do that, but I <clears throat> do you see like anyone else investing in it? I don't know. I think you could with this because it makes a multifunction space. I mean, it, you could technically downsize a studio by a ton just with yeah. 
in several true. spaces like this because instead of like having someone craft and build on set and on location or you know in a in a in a sound stage building effects you're better than that it doesn't look as dead as special effects only like so it, it's a good intermedium yeah it could i guess like if they can get it to a good profit margin right oh yeah where it's like it's not too expensive to do but also like it still provides enough prod like a good quality enough to the product that it's not taking a hit on on like potential viewership i could see maybe them trying it because this is like basically what they're doing now but this just takes it on a more easily like you don't have to put as much work into like conforming the eye to it and everything else and so the eye naturally picks it up as you want it to so it's it's a lot less effort. Like here, here's a, there's a good before and after. So they literally filmed on the state on that soundstage, that yeah. scene, and you can't tell where it is. Yeah, it's fucking huh. insane, right? Yeah, actually, that's yeah, that's that's some of the cinematography shit that I really appreciate. But yeah, was that Twisters? Probably, because I'm just like, I, I felt like a little like needle in my heart there. I was just trying to wonder if that's like maybe like the something deep seated in me after watching that film. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they're like, oh, oh, the pain of. But now, now if you look at it, you can see like I can see the difference slightly in the dirt tone here. Yeah. So but it's like, so, like it's, minimal. It's so subtle, and then like you can see up top, but like if you just eyeballed this, like your eye tells you it doesn't look quite right, but like it looks like it's pretty much a finished scene and realistically yeah, it's, it's not it's one of those things where you you can see it because you know to look for it yeah but like if you didn't know to actually focus on that you would think this could be part of this like this i i could tell that's painted green so they can green screen that out if they catch it at an angle like but yeah you you can really see it like working here but yeah it's just pretty fucking insane and this is so like they could they could uh, they could take multiple shots from multiple angles and you don't have to have like okay we're planning for this angle we need to have a background over here and then you're not you're also not having a dead lifeless like sound stage that's just pure green screen and you know like, yeah, like, it's, like, it's not as lifeless. In films, when you can, like, almost tell that there's, like, some... Like, when you watch a certain film or show where it feels like there's, like, this weird soulless element to it. Yeah. But you can't put your finger on it. Yeah. But, yeah, it's it, it's amazing the shit that they can do out of this. Like, here's another shot with the soundstage. Like, if you start looking at it, you can see the production, but then you can also see what's going to be in the scene. And it's they could instantly set up and change scenes. So that's why it looks more convincing in that show. Because it is actually a blend of it. Yeah. Damn you, yarn lady. <laughs> ...to keep her yarn store open. And according to the publicly available New York State court records, she has had several more legal run-ins and problems with both fulfilling contracts and making payments on time. Also in 2020, String Things Studio had to pay $13,000 to the Workers' Compensation Board of New York for defaulting on payments. In March of 2022, String Things Studio was served an eviction notice and had to pay $12,000 in rent and back rent. In May... I'm going to mute. Just so that if they bark, okay, it doesn't get picked up on the recording and I'll just unmute. You'll still hear me on Discord, though. It just won't pick up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> May of 2022, Felicia had to make a payment of $7,149.38 to Cascade Yarns for a $5,500 non-payment in 2020. It looks like the case went to mediation, but then they sued her again in 2021 because she didn't make the payment on time, and then it took until 2022 for her to make the payment. And these are only the most recent examples of money troubles and fulfilling a contract troubles. I mentioned in the last video that Felicia was a licensed- She's really good at taking money and really bad at paying it back, is what I took away from this. Like she's, she's like me when I was like nineteen. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like when I was still struggling, like to get by. Like except remember this this woman's like gone to school is a doctor. Like, yeah, see that's that's the difference. I was nineteen and starving, and she's like thirty five and pathetic. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, yeah. Like she uh, she potentially could like pay this back and it, it's not necessarily that she even needed the money to begin with 
because in theory she should be pretty well off like i remember looking into felicia on my original stream like she, she's pretty fucking successful she could have self-funded it if she really wanted to i mean honestly she probably could have licensed podiatrist in the late 90s and early 2000s. One of the states where she had her license was in Maryland. And in 2001, she owed the state of Maryland $15,341.32 for tax non-payment, otherwise known as tax evasion. Let this be a reminder to you to go do your taxes right now or apply for an extension. Okay, love you guys. Don't forget. Also not entirely relevant, but interesting is that Felicia bought a property in Park Slope from her ex-husband in 2022 for $1.8 million. They've since divorced, which was legally finalized, it looks like in 2021, but the proceedings have been going on since 2019. I bring this all up to say, Felicia has had money problems for at least the past four years and has always sort of let things slip through the cracks. Another thing I want to bring up is uh, in relation to String Thing Studio, her yarn store. I mentioned in my last video that I had heard from a reliable source that String Thing Studio was closing down its current location and reopening in a different location. Yeah, and if you actually remember, like, she actually went to the studio location. Yeah. And, like, actually went to the physical building. So it's just interesting. The person I spoke with said that the store would be operational in its new location by December of 2023. This did not end up happening and no updates were ever really posted about this. Their website still says that they will be closed until winter and will be opening back up and moving locations. I'm not really sure whatever all happened with that, but the most recent piece of information I've heard was from December. In a group chat intended for planning crafting meetups, Felicia announced that String Thing Studio would be closing down its current location at the end of December. When asked about future plans for the business, she said that this was just the end for this space, but that she would be trying to do some pop-ups around town to see what feels right. And I don't know what's going on behind the scenes other than that, but if you've been waiting with bated breath for a new String Thing Studio location, doesn't look like it's gonna happen but this is uh, this is getting into the realm of speculation i like how she's like yeah really i'll, I'll do pop-ups around the city it's like yeah just like how you just popped up at that other place and just started selling shit yeah like like you're just gonna like just roll into some business's parking lot and be like yeah no i own this <laughs> like, and i sell yarn well it worked really for... it worked really well for the the woolen folk thing <laughs> why not <laughs> It's like, ma'am, this is a this is a Wendy's. <laughs> it's like, no, this is the yarn festival. It's like, like, no, no, I'm pretty sure it's the Wendy's. Like, oh my god, this is this is this is literally like the equivalent of like, hey, uh, can I use uh this space of yours, Jim, um, for something really quick? I just, it's not gonna be a big deal. I'll be in and out. And then like you show up to like the actual event, and it's like fifteen hundred people. <laughs> Not just that, but like you ask me after you've already parked your vehicle and started unloading into my yard. Like, do you mind if I just borrow your yard for a picnic? And it's like you already have the grill set up. Like the ribs are like half baked. And it's like well, you wake you got, up to it that way. Yeah, you got smoked meat on my yard. Like in the middle of my apartment complex courtyard, you put a small pop up basketball hoop. Like at this point it's a little too late to ask. Like I feel like she operates under that modus operandi of like better to better to beg for, for forgiveness, forgiveness than, than ask, ask for permission. permission. Yeah. Yeah. She must have worked at Walmart at one point in her life. <laughs> Like, well, that was the motto we had there. <laughs> well, it's clear that Felicia struggles with event planning and money managing. She does have a passion for creating community. And in many ways, that's what this yarn store was for a large group of people. So it's disappointing that that's not a part of the community anymore. So yeah, what went so wrong? In her statement to the Times Union, Felicia attributes the disappointment of Woolen Folk 2023 in large part to how successful the event was in previous years. Many attendees cited the smaller, cozier atmosphere of Woolen Folk as being a lot more manageable and enjoyable Are than the larger- Are you serious? <laughs> it failed because I'm just so good. <laughs> <laughs> always fail up jim always fail up you, you pretentious <laughs> fuck get your golden parachute out of here you loser like, felicia says fucking our grandma first two almost died <laughs> 2022 were very well received with over 90 vendors and 3,500 guests. The events were stellar and exceeded the community's expectations, so much so that additional vendors and guests were registered for our 2023 festival. It goes without saying that 2023 did not unfold according to plan because a relatively last minute venue change required us to adjust and the weather made matters even worse. So yeah, the past events went really well. Minder, minder, like the original thing that happened with this vendor, like, okay, she announced the event, I think in April. In May, she was already being told you can't have the event here. Like, the city's not going to approve it. And this event was in, like, October. And she decided to wait till, like, August to resolve the situation. Like, the end of August. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> that reminds me of a gaming drama. Oh my god. Well, people love that. Uh... And that's why this one was so bad. Not the Mud City. Not the completely inaccessible last minute change to venue. Not the bathroom on the scary fifth floor. Not the cardboard put down on the mud for people to slip slide all around. Not the lack of maps, signage, or communication. Let, let's not forget, too, that the cardboard that was put down on the ground for people to step on belonged to somebody else that actually had brought their stuff there to sell. They were asked permission on where they could put their boxes and store them for the event period. And in, because... in all of the chaos, somebody found a stack of cardboard boxes and said, let's just start cutting these up and put them down for pathways. And you probably, they probably needed those boxes because you screwed them out of their spot and they weren't making sales. Yeah. So they probably needed them to pack up all of their fancy crafts that they spent so hard to make. Yeah. And you're just like, yeah, no, this is ours now. <laughs> like, she's like, oh, she sounds like the yarn equivalent of a son piker. Like, <laughs> like some. It's like, your your son piker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like like some fluffy communist. Like these these are our boxes. Like fluffy communist. <laughs> like you just come up like this is our boxes. This is our yarn. They just start taking your shit, and you're like, what? <laughs> you can't mine. No, this is ours. <laughs> Thank you for bringing boxes, comrade. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, like before the, like, there's, like, a Bolshevik yard rebellion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Or the attendees. No, no, no. It was because they set the bar too high the first few years, and people loved it so much. Irina from Fiber Chats did a really interesting interview with Felicia after the second year of Woolen Folk. This video is a fascinating conversation where they discuss like what really goes into planning a fiber festival. Irina's a great interviewer, by the way. If you're interested in the story, you should only go watch this whole video. I'll link it in the description. It's it's interesting to see this all like with hindsight. One of the biggest things that I noticed from this interview and this point in time that made the previous two years go more according to plan was Felicia's co-founder, Catherine Clark from Brooklyn General Store, and the production team that they hired to help them with the event. So Catherine was not a part of the 2023 Woolen Folk planning at all for reasons that have not been made public. But with the hindsight we have now of the disaster that this third annual festival was, this video interview is even more interesting. When Felicia was asked about the things that were important in finding a venue, she said it was important for a venue to be accessible, pretty, and to have a place to sit and for people to hang out and chat. And the actual venue was important too, something that was accessible and pretty and some place you'd want to actually sit and just enjoy the time and not just kind of run through and go to the next thing. Felicia also talked pretty extensively about how she wanted to create an experience. She sure succeeded there. You know, you could forget how what people said to you or, you know, but you always remember how people made you feel, right? She's not exactly exuding to me poor and desperate in this image. Yeah, you'll always remember how you feel. Yeah, drenched, coated in mud. <laughs> half, my product, half my product missing or damaged. Yeah, I'll always remember how like my little yarn guy fell into a puddle of mud and got trampled <laughs> by fucking grandma on her walker because you decided to play, put the pathway right through my shop. Oh yeah, my yeah, I'll always remember you, Felicia. Always. Wait, is this a bathroom balcony? Does our bathroom have a balcony? That's a sink, which would make this, and it looks like it, is a tub. Is there a TV above her sink? Yes. So she yes. can fucking. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's this TV bitch, in the bathroom, Rich. This, this, yeah, this bitch can have a fucking balcony bathroom with her own goddamn flat screen TV but she can't decide where to put the red yarn <laughs> you know I'm gonna just hop on like the old fucking thing I just said it's like I just hope that the red and white armies just clash right like the red, ar the red yarn army and the white yarn army just start fighting oh my god <laughs> I just She's TV in the bathroom, Rich. Like, let's, let's, let's and and like you know, let's talk about like I can see some of the view out here. I don't know if this is a bathtub window, or if it's a reflection or a painting. I can't totally tell. Well, I know how she afforded it. <laughs> yeah, I do too. <laughs> Emma said it earlier. She didn't pay her fucking taxes. Well, Christ, that's if that's all I gotta do. That's, that's the government sink. <laughs> that's the government sink. That's our, that's we're our back, bathroom TV. We're back to the communism. This is our balcony bathroom now. Like... <laughs> I didn't even know balcony bathrooms were a thing. I mean, I guess they are. I mean, just 
try. Maybe you'll get one. Just don't pay your taxes for like three years and see if one just pops up. And you know, I, federal prison is too much of a risk with that. And I don't get enough tax money to where I would think that bathroom balcony with bathroom TV included is still going to be in the tangibility range for me. Yeah, but look how long it took for them to get Blade. <laughs> you know, it took, it took them years to get Blade, and clearly, like, she didn't pay her taxes, and she still can have this. You can get a good five, ten years before you have to move to Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> before you have to go get some totadas. Like... <laughs> Eating tortas out of the dumpster? Yeah, great. Yeah. Living out of my Mexican lawyer's backyard? Fantastic yeah. lifestyle. I mean, you hey, it's... We know one man makes it work. <laughs> so, like... like they weren't being rushed. You know, they that they were important. We want to show you all the things. We want to make sure we had all the things that we as human beings would have liked to have seen at a festival and hadn't seen necessarily. Also in this interview, Irina asks Felicia. <laughs> Something I haven't seen. Yeah, like that is that is the, the view. Well, that is the view. Look, her hand. Look, her hand. Oh my god. So this is... That's the view out of her bathroom balcony, reflecting. I... I hate her even more. I hate her all the way. All yeah, the way. Like I, I'm Skyrimming it. I hate her so much that I'm back to level one again. Did you like, game game bust on hate? Yeah, yeah, I rolled over. <laughs> I have so much hate bonus. Oh, like, my God. Yeah. Yeah, watch watch in the background. Watch her hand move really quick. Things. We want to make sure we had all the see? things that we as human beings would have liked to see. That's a reflection. You son of a bitch. You seen at a festival and hadn't seen necessarily. Also in this interview, Irina asks Felicia about some of the mistakes that they made in the first two years that they want to improve upon for the third year. Felicia referenced the check-in process and parking problems and then kind of went on a tangent about how hard it was for people to want. She wanted to resolve the parking problems. So she made it worse. <laughs> yeah. so like, we, we decided you guys that won't... we weren't going to do parking. <laughs> yeah. like, we just... It's like, no longer yeah. a problem for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, if you don't engage with the problem, it doesn't exist. Just like my taxes. Like, it's a proven method. <laughs> I think you're on to something here. Want to talk to her? I am. Well, you, you mentioned also that like you learn from the mistakes of the first year and you change things around for this year. Mm -hmm. Were there any mistakes that you can think of that you need to... For this year? Yeah. Yes. Next year. Like, like the check-in process was um, a lot because everybody, I mean, we had sold 2,500 tickets before we even opened the gates. And then we had people that were showing up at the day of buying tickets, right? We could we could have used more volunteers and we thought we had more than enough that we needed. I know I was everywhere. <laughs> like I was at the check-in booth. I was at my own booth. I was at the merch booth. And then I hosted all the podcast patios. And along with that comes a responsibility, a celebrity, if you if you would say that can be a little overwhelming parking was definitely a situation that we have to deal with because the space has only really has so many places that you can park you know we had asked should we have a shuttle to bring people over and they were oh no it's not a big deal but it literally biblically rained the day before right. and so there was a huge the, the pathway from the lot to the venue was a muddy mess right this feels pretty poignant to me because they were pretty aware wait so she's aware of mud she's aware I, mud is a thing i just like that how she's like you know like biblically rains so it's like all right so let's not let's expect that to never happen again <laughs> so what you're telling me is you were such a failure that god decided to do like sodom and gomorrah too well this is like, this is that interview took place between 2022 and 2023 so these were problems that existed with the successful versions see, see this is where like god was like oh i, I can't let this happen it, it worked with sodom and gomorrah so i'm just I'm just going to just flood it. Noah, I'm get the boys. Going to, We're going I'm to work. I'm just going to flood it. <laughs> but then, you know, so he starts flooding, but he didn't realize that, like, this ark was made out of autistic yarn, and it just floated away. And God's like, damn it, Satan beat me this time. And then, like, Grandma just slips and breaks her hip and just slides down the hill uh... into the bowels of hell. Like... Uh of the problems they had the past few years and they just like didn't really do anything to fix them and then the problems just got worse the year after and most importantly she says when you look at the list of things that you know wrong to right we did more right than we did wrong irena pokes at her a little and asks a controversial question which is basically you're charging a lot more for ticket entry than these other events do you think that's a problem or a concern mm -hmm. was, was that a concern for you like were you concerned that you charging way more than yeah this is december 1st 2022 is when this interview took place you're so, charging more why so, can't you have shuttles then so this was when it was successful. Jesus. So this is the post interview of a successful, like well received woolen folk. And she's like, you know what? We're gonna take all the issues, we're gonna fix them by ignoring them. 
Um, we're going to bring in some new issues just to make everybody that much unhappier and mature just slightly more. <laughs> you know what she just did? She just got Sim City, but then bought the Natural Disaster DLC. <laughs> yeah. Like, she's because it's like you know, new features, new disasters, find new ways, find new problems to solve. I'm in. Yeah. And she swiped her. She swiped her friend's card because you know she doesn't pay anything herself. Oh well, and, clearly, you know why do that? You know, then she, she swipes her friend's card and just uploads it to her. Her, you know yarn festival and then it's like oh yeah, yeah this is great like oh man all the other venues in the area no and i'll tell you why in response to additional concerns that some vendors had about asking their supporters to come to an event with ticket prices so high felicia basically said that's none of their business my position was that's not really their place you know like if you can pay your vendor fee and we provide this great venue for you to be able to, to host these people they should just be excited it that did provide the big venue <laughs> You're already arguing a fallacy that doesn't exist. <laughs> to be fair, at this time, she thought she had the orchard. It's like, uh, if we provide this big venue, what, for the one vendor that it would be a big venue for? <laughs> yeah, it's a big vendor. It's a big venue for, like, two people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Who are willing to pay. $55 to come in and then shop. Felicia has great ideas. You can't deny that she has a proclivity for building community, but has just shown time and time again that she can't handle the business or money side of things. She has a track record for not paying on time, not fulfilling contracts, and generally being slow about communicating on legal issues. These are not things you want to have from someone running a big event. The more that comes out about this event, the more clear it is that the disaster of the festival was not a fluke or a chance happening. It was the result of genuinely poor planning right from the core of the event that only became exacerbated once Felicia lost her co-planner and did have bad luck with the weather. I personally don't see a way for her to come back for this. As sorry as she is, as hard as she tries to drown out this negative press, I just don't a scenario where fiber artists decide to trust her again to put on another event but as always only time will tell thanks again to Scentford for sponsoring this video so what do you think um i just really hope that there's somebody that's been slighted by this oh there's like, a lot I'm of people my, oh i'm gonna go make my own yarn festival and they just fucking blow hers out of the water well remember remember one of the people that came to this runs another one of the bigger yarn festivals in the world and that was the scottish yarn festival yeah, bring that to the states. And Make like, it a world tour, like. Well, the thing is, is Rhinebeck is so big, and so popular, and so well received, that it spawned these like sub events around it. This is like a Comic Con precursor, the week of Comic Con. What we just need is we just need Big Yarn to come in. Like... <laughs> Like, we just need Big Yarn to come in and start self-funding. They need like... to untangle this mess. Yeah. <laughs> Weave together the community. <laughs> yeah, because, like, I think it's... I think it would string me out if I had to plan it. <laughs> well, they're locked in tatters right now. <laughs> what a tapestry they weave. Oh, man, this has me in stitches. <laughs> Just like grandma when she <laughs> fell because of the mud. That brings a new meaning to stitches. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Grandma uh, died, Patrick. <laughs> grandma uh, Linda's not coming home. 